You know them, you love them. It's ethos, pathos, and logos. Well, hey there, we've been talking about Aristotle's rhetoric for all this time, and we finally made it to book two. So if you've been following along this far, then you already know that Aristotle defines rhetoric as a tool for finding all of the available means of persuasion in a given situation. You know that Aristotle does not follow other philosophers in viewing rhetoric as a bargain basement knockoff of philosophy. Instead, he views it as its own thing, trying to accomplish different tasks. You also know that Aristotle defines three main genres of rhetoric, dealing with decisions about the future, judgments about the past, and evaluations of the present. And by now you'll be up to speed in knowing that Aristotle spends a good chunk of his text describing the common patterns for persuasive arguments. But now we get to talk about what may just be Aristotle's most famous and enduring contribution to the study of rhetoric, the three artistic means of persuasion, ethos, pathos, and logos. And by artistic, or what some translations call antechnic, we mean that these artful means of persuasion require some technique or skill. These are in contrast to the inartistic or atechnic means of persuasion, like contracts or witnesses. You don't really need skill in order to bring them into an argument. That is, you don't need to do much to persuade somebody that your neighbor has cheated you for sending you 10 crates of pineapples when they signed a contract saying they'd send you 50, and you don't really need a lot of technique to bring in a witness who says that they saw the colonel headed to the conservatory with a candlestick. So the artistic means of persuasion are not called that because they're more beautiful, but rather because they require some kind of artfulness or skillfulness in understanding a situation and adapting to it accordingly. And according to Aristotle, they tend to work in three main ways, through the emotions, through reasoning, or through perceptions of character. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's show. We'll begin by talking about each of them individually, and then we'll finish up by talking about why all three are necessary and useful elements of effective persuasion. And we'll continue to do what Aristotle did by highlighting what it is that makes rhetoric a unique and useful discipline, and not just the questionable cousin of philosophy. So let's do it. Aristotle says that the end goal of rhetoric is judgment, so a speaker uses rhetoric in order to motivate their audience to adopt a particular stance towards the subject at hand. And as he also points out, emotions play a large and important role in the formation of judgments. For things do not seem the same to those who are friendly and those who are hostile. To one who is friendly, the person about whom he passes judgment seems not to do wrong or only in a small way. To one who is hostile, the opposite. So prosecutors aim to augment your negative feelings towards the accused, advertisers try to associate their products with your fond memories and aspirations, and activists do everything they can to get you to empathize with polar bears. Now, before we go any further, it's crucial to recognize what pathos is not. First, pathos is not about what people resort to when they can't make a good argument. Nowhere does Aristotle say that emotions are a cheap way out that you must use when you've run out of good statistics. Instead, he addresses emotions first and spends almost as much time talking about them as he does reason. Second, pathos is not about manipulation. People, often those with backgrounds in science and philosophy, like to say that the emotions are a tool for the unscrupulous to manipulate the weak-minded public. Well, not only does that reveal an attitude towards the public that is a little rude, but it also ignores the fact that it was Archimedes who streaked through town shouting Eureka, and Carl Sagan who waxed poetic about our pale blue dot. Even in the discourse of those coldly rational disciplines, emotions still play a large and fundamental role. So the idea of pathos attunes us to the ways in which emotions influence the formation of judgments. Really, it's about accepting and working with the objective fact that people are subjective. People have emotions, and we're operating outside of practical reality when we try to ignore them. Another thing we often get wrong about emotions is thinking that they're only at play when we're making somebody cry or whipping them up into a pitchfork-bearing mob. Those are maybe dramatic examples of emotions at work, but they're rarely or ever the actual goal. In fact, one of the most effective and useful applications of emotion is to make sure that your audience cares about what you have to say. And you can accomplish that by something as easy as telling them why it should matter to them. And that's important because a lot of people only express their opinions in terms of what's important to them. The reality is that your audience doesn't need to know why you care about the subject, they need to know why they should care. Additionally, it's about getting your audience into an emotional state where they will be willing to listen to what you have to say. So yes, you might be full of righteous and justified indignation, but what are you going to accomplish if you 
you start hurling out accusations and alienating your audience? What happens when you drive away the very people whose cooperation you depend on? So Aristotle spends a good amount of time talking about various emotional states, describing their nature, causes, and relevant contexts. In other words, Aristotle's work on emotions suggests that you're going to need a basic understanding of anger in the event that you ever come across an angry audience, and that you'll probably want a basic understanding of the feelings of friendship if you're ever going to forge a functioning collaboration. But with all due respect to the author, I think Augustine of Hippo captures the most useful essence of pathos in one of my favorite lines of rhetorical thought. We often have to take bitter medicines, and we must always avoid sweet things that are dangerous. But what better than sweet things that give health, or medicines that are sweet? The more we are attracted by sweetness, the easier it is for medicine to do its healing work. There's no rule that says that medicine only works if it tastes bad, so why not make it palatable? We can talk about specific bitter emotions in specific contexts, but when we think about emotion in general, I've never heard a convincing argument that it's a bad thing to have the goodwill of your audience. And yet those who eschew emotions on the grounds of intellectual enlightenment often frame their important and potentially world-changing arguments in terms that are so pedantic and off-putting and then they wonder why nobody wants to listen. Like, seriously, if Socrates had invested even 5% of his skill points in emotional intelligence, he might not have been known as the gadfly, and he might not have been forced to drink hemlock. There really isn't a rule that says that truth must be conveyed in the most distasteful way possible. And Aristotle acknowledges that by spending so much time talking about the importance of emotions. Okay, so let's try something fun today. YouTube might choose to show you an advertisement here in a second, and when they do, I want you to pay some attention to the emotions that the advertiser is trying to connect to. How do they work to get their audience to care about what they have to say? What emotions are they evoking? Let me know in the comments. When it comes to ethos, Aristotle says, there is persuasion through character whenever the speech is spoken in such a way as to make the speaker worthy of credence. The Greek word ethos refers to character, so ethos comes down to showing your audience that you are a person of good character or that you are trustworthy. And again, before anyone starts on the old claim that rhetoric is about appearing to be trustworthy while you secretly manipulate people, that's not what we're talking about. Ethos is about showing your audience that you are, in fact, worthy of their trust. And the idea that good moral character is essential to the practice of rhetoric is not isolated to Aristotle. In fact, the famous Roman teacher of rhetoric, Quintilian, described his curriculum as having the goal of producing a good man skilled in speaking. And then he went on to explain why he thought that a bad person could never be as good at rhetoric as a good one. That's because in Quintilian's estimation, a bad person is going to spend too much time pursuing their vices to really develop their oratorical skills. And whether we believe that or not, Aristotle also said in Book 1 that the truth is unavoidably and inherently more persuasive than a falsehood. So even if you had a good person and a bad person on opposite sides of an issue with equally impressive persuasive skills, the good person would still win out because the rhetorical process would sift out what isn't true. So it's worth emphasizing that rhetoric is not about deceit and manipulation. There's no basis for that position from within the discipline, and rhetoricians have repudiated that kind of behavior for thousands of years. But anyway, Aristotle goes on to describe the characters of various groups of people, the old, the young, the middle-aged, the wealthy, the prosperous, and so on. And his discussion of ethos, though brief, does give us some insights into the nature of our audiences so that we can adapt to their character, but also understand how they might perceive our presentation of our own character. A common problem of ethos is one that I see often when students come to me while they're working on a persuasive paper. More than once I've heard someone say, I'm just a first-year college student. Why should anyone listen to what I have to say? And it's a reasonable question. As relatively young and inexperienced writers, what reason would an audience, especially a more experienced, more wealthy, or more powerful audience, have to listen to their argument? Luckily, Aristotle writes that ethos is something you have to establish in the speech itself. So you can't just point to the fact that you have a PhD and expect people to trust them, nor can you rely on your mother's quoted conviction that you are, in fact, a good person. Instead, you need to demonstrate those things in the moment, and that's one of the major reasons that academic writers cite sources. It's not just to bring the facts to your argument, but to show that you 
you're the kind of responsible and trustworthy person who's willing to put in the work of doing that research. And for writers who have reservations about their qualifications, that's the simplest fix. Do the work and then show your audience that you've done it. You don't have to be the most knowledgeable person to show that you're trustworthy. Because after all, as Aristotle writes, there are three things we trust other than logical demonstration. These are practical wisdom and virtue and goodwill. So we can show we're trustworthy by just having all of the knowledge. We can write infallible logical proofs or throw so much data at our audience that they can't do anything but agree. But that's not the only way. Sure, you can get somebody to trust your cookie recipe by telling them all about the Maillard reaction and sugar ratios and evaporation rates, but you can also do it by telling them about how you've made the same recipe for decades with excellent results. Practical wisdom is not worthless, and it's a good way to build trust. Or if you recognize somebody as having unusual and unfailing virtue, you may be willing to trust them without them needing to make a formal moral argument first. And while your mother could cite clinical trials while dosing out your cough syrup, it's more likely that you're willing to trust her just based on her unfailing goodwill towards you. And that wouldn't be wrong. That would be a trust that's verified by experience rather than by abstract logic. As with emotion, the rhetorical approach to trust recognizes the wide range of human experiences and motivations. It's not about confining your audience to a narrow rationality. Instead, it's about recognizing where they are and then making your own adjustments in order to establish a meaningful connection. Maybe like whoever created this next advertisement. And saving the last for last, we come to Logos, which deals with what is or isn't reasonable. As Aristotle puts it, persuasion occurs through the arguments when we show the truth or the apparent truth from whatever is persuasive in each case. Persuasion involves telling the truth and making sense, so it's always a little wild to hear people say that rhetoric is what you do when you don't have the truth to stand on. If rhetoric could happen in the absence of truth, Aristotle wouldn't have spent the most time explaining logos out of the three. But it is important to recognize that rhetorical reasoning and philosophical reasoning are different things, and Aristotle makes that distinction clear in his own terminology. Philosophy, he says, works on the basis of the syllogism, which is a formal logical structure that leads leads to a specific conclusion, such as that Socrates is mortal because he is a man and all men are mortal. Rhetoric, in turn, operates on the basis of the enthymeme, or rhetorical syllogism, but unlike the philosophical syllogism which works on rationality, the enthymeme works on reasonableness. So where philosophy derives its conclusions through a strict formal process of logic, the enthymeme and rhetoric in turn draws its conclusions from what James Friedel has called a kind of narrative inference. And Aristotle explains it like this, that the enthymeme is a kind of syllogism has been said earlier, and how it is a syllogism and in what it differs from those in dialectic. For in rhetoric, the conclusion should not be drawn from far back, nor is it necessary to include everything. The former is unclear because of the length of the argument, the latter tiresome because of stating what is obvious. This is the reason why the uneducated are more persuasive than the educated when speaking before crowds. For the educated reason with axioms and universals, the uneducated on the basis of what particulars they know and instances near their experience. Thus, one should not speak on the basis of all opinions, but of those held by a defined group, and do not draw the conclusion only from what is necessarily valid, but also from what is true for the most part. So, for example, returning to our Socrates-inspired syllogism, Aristotle points out that this method of reasoning is not very useful or effective when it comes to public persuasion. For starters, it's built on a method of reason that requires every step of the process to be spelled out formally. And here we only have two steps, so it's not that big of a deal, but chances are your audience is already on board with the fact that Socrates is a man and that men are mortal, so why rehearse them all over again? And it gets worse with more complex arguments. If A is true and B is true and C is true and D is true and E is true, and if F is true, then so on and so on, then Z must be true. But by then, your audience has already clicked away. You've done your due diligence in the logical process, but nobody is around to hear your important conclusion. But not only that, how useful really is the conclusion of this syllogism? Our formal, irrefutable process of logic has yielded the world-shattering conclusion that Socrates is mortal. And that's great, but 
who was even questioning that to begin with? It was already apparent to everyone from the start, so why drag them through the process? And for these reasons, then, Aristotle says that experts are bad at persuasion. They insist on explaining every methodological step and describing their abstract theoretical frameworks. And that's great if you're talking to other experts, but it's the kiss of death if you're trying to engage real people who are living real lives. That's why, for example, academic research articles have lengthy method sections, large data tables, and detailed descriptions of statistical analyses, while the press releases just talk about the discovery and its implications. Those more detailed methodological things are important in the discourse among experts, but they're practically useless outside of that very narrow circle. So where Aristotle defines rhetoric as a tool for engaging and motivating large audiences made up of non-experts, the tools of formal logic just aren't that useful. They force the audience to go through a series of unnecessary steps, and then they lead to conclusions that the audience probably already knows and agrees with already. A philosopher doing philosophy needs to be able to whittle away every possible illusion or uncertainty in order to arrive at the irrefutable conclusion that they exist because they think. But a person just living their life already understands that they exist and is probably on board with the fact that other people do too. Returning then to Friedel, the enthymeme and the reasoning of rhetoric strives for irrefutability, but a rhetorical and strategic irrefutability, not a logical one. He then goes on to say, the best enthymemes are or seem irrefutable, not in the sense that they rely on logically certain or universal premises or valid syllogistic form. These criteria are irrelevant to public rhetorical interactions. They are irrefutable in the practical sense that the opponent cannot easily refute them or that the audience will be struck with the impression that the conclusion, once heard, is unavoidable and that the opponent's position is incredible or impossible. That is, philosophers doing philosophy are looking for irrefutable facts, logical conclusions that they can trust are true with absolute certainty. However, rhetors doing rhetoric are just trying to get things done. These are very different objectives with very different priorities and correspondingly different methods. The tools of rhetoric are just as inappropriate in your formal logic class as the tools of formal logic are for persuading the assembly not to vote for a war with Sparta. For that reason, I like to keep a distinction in mind between what is rational and what is reasonable. Rhetoric doesn't proceed in terms of what is strictly rational, instead it pursues what is reasonable. And you may have heard people say that arguments are invalid because they rely on irrational things like emotions or faith or fill in the blank. And sure, some of those things may be irrational, at least in the sense that they resist the formal strictures of logic, but they are salient and significant parts of people's lives and experiences. So it's completely reasonable to pay attention to them, especially if you're trying to understand why people people do what they do. So to summarize, Logos is about what's reasonable. It's concerned with clear, careful thinking and a grounding in practical truth. Rhetoric doesn't adopt the tools of formal logic for much the same reason that physicists don't adopt the methods of contemporary dancers. Fundamentally, Logos is about finding and communicating what makes the most sense so that you can get something done. And with that, what do you say we check out some advertisers' Logos? Okay, we've talked about a lot, but this is where it gets good, and it's also why I wanted to talk about all three of these things in one video, so thanks for sticking with me. First, we often talk about these three tools in isolation, and it's common for me to hear people talk, for example, about advertisements using ethos, pathos, or logos, as if you could do one without also doing the others. Even a highly pathetic public service announcement about adopting dogs that shows a lot of weepy hounds in cages will have to use some kind of logos, it has to make sense on some level, and they'll have to establish trust in some way or else the announcement will fail. So all three are working all the time. One might be foregrounded ahead of the others, but they're all still there. And that's a good thing because they all correct for each other. Your argument becomes more persuasive when all three, reasoning, feeling, and trusting, are working together in harmony. And that's the genius of this framework in my eyes. It recognizes that people are complex and that a whole range of things plays into people's motivations and decision making. If you only use one or the other, chances are you won't get very far. But if you do acknowledge that your audience is complex and that it takes more than just logic to persuade them, 
well, then you may just get somewhere. So, for example, we often hear people say that they wish everyone could just use the facts, or that something like facts and logic are all you need to make a good decision. But let's imagine that you have heaps of data and loads of irrefutable logical proofs that your position is correct. So you present them to your public audience, and then nobody does anything at all. You might lament the anti-intellectual state of society, which honestly says more about your ego than about society, or you could begin to think rhetorically. Logic won't go far if nobody cares. No one is going to listen to your truth if you haven't given them a reason to. So think about what's at stake for your audience. What would get them invested in what you have to say? The answer to that question is the pathos you're looking for. And similarly, facts won't help much if your audience suspects you of using manipulative statistics to interpret the data. So you'll need to give them reasons to trust you and your facts. Use some insights grounded in ethos to show them that your information is indeed credible. Likewise, your emotions can be bolstered through logos. If people can see that there's a good reason for you to feel the way that you do, they'll be more likely to empathize and feel the same way. And if they can see that you have good character, they'll trust that you aren't using your emotions to manipulate them for your own benefit. Finally, showing and evoking the right emotions can augment your ethos. People are more likely to trust you if your emotions agree with the occasion. That's why we might rebuke someone for telling a joke after a tragedy by saying, hmm, too soon. And of course, having a good backing in strong reasoning shows your audience that you're responsible, that you've done your homework, and ultimately that you can be trusted. These three artistic means of persuasion are mutually reinforcing. They strengthen your persuasion because they attune you to the full range of things that are at play when people make decisions. Overemphasize any one of them to the point of neglecting the others, and you're not going to get anything done. Use them all together in an appropriate and balanced way, though, and you'll have your audiences trust their hearts and their minds as you work together to accomplish good and important things. Well, hey, that was fun, if not maybe a little longer than our usual adventures. But I guess I've said just about all I have to say on this topic, so I'll conclude by leaving you once more with my gratitude. It really is a blast to spend this time with you. I kind of learned about rhetoric by accident in college, and well, of course, the rest is history. So it's a lot of fun to share these things with you, too. I'm convinced that good rhetorical training could resolve a lot of the dysfunction that we see in the world today. I mean, just imagine what we could accomplish if we learned how to actually talk with each other instead of past each other or against each other. I think that would be pretty amazing. Amazing. So I'm glad that you've chosen to stick around and listen to me talk about all this stuff. Now I guess all that's left is for you to put it into practice as you write more meaningful, more responsible, and more effective things. Have a great week while you do, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.